Tourism is big business. There's almost nowhere on Earth you can't go. But the ultimate destination may be 100 kilometers above your head. Space tourism visionaries are creating the next generation of holidays that are out of this world. The getaway of the future will be a trip to the stars, the opportunity to rocket far from the Earth. The 21st century spaceman could be you. This could be the ride of your life. The final frontier offers the greatest adventure holidays. Check into a luxury billion star space hotel. Catch a game of football in zero gravity. Come on! Or treat your partner to a date with a difference by taking them to dinner trillions of kilometers from home. The Wright brothers didn't think there'd be hundreds of people having a meal going to London. I think that in my lifetime, you will see resort hotels in orbit. Stardate 2020. Your dream holiday starts here. Just $4 million buys a seat to fly a couple of hundred kilometers into outer space. This is the Galactic Suite Space Resort. Your room is a super deluxe pod with zero gravity as standard. And this room comes with the most incredible of views. The resort orbits the Earth every 80 minutes. It's possible to watch not just one spectacular sunset, but 15 every day. And this isn't science fiction. It's about to become science fact. In the Spanish city of Barcelona, a team of space architects are hard at work designing a space hotel fit for the stars. They're backed by a secret investor with $3 billion of cash to splash. And they're already taking reservations. Never before has the space been designed for tourists, where their comfort, needs and activities take on a different level of importance. What's important to us is to be amongst the first that can do it. At his boutique hotel, Xavier plans a three-bedroom deluxe suite. The hotel will travel around the globe at 30,000 kilometers an hour, 450 kilometers up. Xavier's even planned a holiday wardrobe for the space tourist. Check in and slip on a Velcro spacesuit. And you can attach yourself to a wall like Spider-Man. 38 wealthy wannabe space tourists have already booked their hotel rooms in outer space. Even though the plans are still on the drawing board. But across the Atlantic, one man is betting on making your space vacation dreams come true even sooner. Just a few kilometers from the casinos, billionaire hotelier Robert Bigelow is taking the biggest gamble of his life. I kept it a secret for a long time, 
as to what my real ambitions were, trying to work like a dog and save money and take a lot of risks. Robert made his fortune in hotels. Now he set his sights a lot higher. But his plans came as a surprise back at home. When I told my wife that I was going to do something like this, she said, you're going to do what? Robert's idea is out of this world. He's taking real estate into space, developing a giant space station that gives new meaning to high-rise living. He intends it to be used for different purposes, as a home, an office, or a weekend retreat. What we're out to do is try to create a, a safe, affordable environment that's larger and larger for people to do all kinds of things. Hey, I'm in position base. Building in space is a costly exercise. The International Space Station cost a whopping $100 billion. Robert needed a design that would be far easier to construct and one that wouldn't break the bank to build. NASA came up with a solution. They were developing a huge, lightweight space habitat that inflates in orbit, making it cheap and easy to launch. But when NASA's research costs spiraled, the project was scrapped. Robert saw his chance and snapped up the plans. These systems are extremely strong. They're not balloons. Best correlation I can give you would be comparing it to the tire on your car. And it's made up of uh, multiple layers, steel belts, and other kinds of, of very strong materials. And that's the same way with our architecture. But would the idea fly? There was only one way to find out. In 2006, Robert launched a prototype, hitching a ride on a Russian rocket. In my mind, I thought, there's going to be all kinds of things going wrong. We're going to fail. To everyone's amazement, not only did the station inflate, but it also managed to broadcast extraordinary live footage back to Earth. The biggest shock was, oh my god, you know, what we're doing is working for, for real. This, it can't get any better than this. Now Robert is building the real thing, a full-sized place in space. The launch party is planned for 2014, and the onboard entertainment promises to be spectacular. We will also have many cameras on board our spacecraft and on a large section of wall, see uh, any number of different angles of what's outside. So you could get right up on the moon, even though you're only in low Earth orbit, you might be, have the moon right in your, in your face. With limitless shapes and sizes, inflatable buildings could make almost anything possible in space. Imagine experiencing new sports that can only be played in the zero gravity of space. Join the crowd at the Zero Gravity World Cup in a gigantic orbital space sports stadium. This is the dawn of a new era of space tourism. The sky is no longer the limit. But some have been unable to wait to get their space fix. In 2006, Iranian-American entrepreneur Anusha Ansari became one of the first space tourists. I believe that there is something inside us always attracting us to the night skies, maybe because we're made of stardust. 
she paid $20 million to take a holiday at the International Space Station and made a video of her adventure. Just having the opportunity to fly from one end of the station all the way to the other, uh, it was great. And I tried to go really fast and show off that, you know, I, I, I'm made to be in space. I'm made to be an astronaut. Everything on board was pretty relaxed, especially in the dining room. It's the only place that you're allowed to play with your food. Any simple task that you do on a daily basis, you know, brushing your teeth, drinking water, just eating can be fun. And in space, there's not much space. But this is a room with a view. This is my sleeping bag right here right by the best view from the world. And I can see the clouds, the Earth rotating by. I see the curvature right there. That was actually my favorite time to just, you know, look at the night skies. I felt like, you know, I could live in space forever. Anusha's trip cost her a cool $2 million a night. But there's good news for the rest of us. In your lifetime, you could be taking your own more luxurious, affordable space adventure. Ten, nine, eight, go for main engine start. Six, five, four. One thing stands between you and the ultimate holiday in space, gravity. To overcome it costs a fortune. Half a billion dollars per shuttle launch. The rockets use vast amounts of fuel held in gigantic throwaway tanks. It's clear that for space tourism to take off, some clever thinking was needed. So in 2004, millionaire space enthusiast Anusha Ansari set the world a challenge by funding a $10 million competition to create low-cost spacecraft. The only thing that can drive innovation is competition, to make access to space faster, safer, easier, and cheaper. Teams from around the world took up her X-Prize challenge. But in Mojave, California, Maverick engineer Bert Rutan was ahead of the game. He was already working on a secret spacecraft. Can you do a dog? A dog? That's right. Bert is an aviation legend. You might say he's light years ahead of the competition. Okay, I'm going to do a lion. Okay, you ready? <laughs> he had already built a plane so lightweight, it flew around the globe on a single tank of fuel. And he smashed altitude records with Proteus, which soared to more than 63,000 feet. Now, he's set his sights on sending tourists into space. Listening to those that have been in space, the way they describe it, it seems life-changing to look down on the planet. And a chance to go there and look at that? Wow. Just five months after the X Prize was announced, Bert Rutan rolled out Spaceship One. It had taken more than three years to build. To escape Earth's gravity, Bert used an ingenious design, with not one plane, but two. An aircraft would carry the space plane beneath its fuselage and release it at 50,000 feet, 
dropped a rocket into space. Pilot Brian Binney fired the rocket. Good work. Good work. Come in. Holy that was cool. He narrowly missed a collision with the mothership. That's good though. 350, we shut down. Roger, shut down. Within seconds, he had crossed the boundary into space, 100 kilometers above Earth. Well, it's really quiet up here. I'm gonna get the camera out. Roger that. Billy was able to take a few snaps for the album from the first privately built spaceship to reach space. The civilian race for space had been won. But for Bert, this was only the start of his dream. If I could please invite onto the stage Bert Rutan, the designer of the first private spaceship, Spaceship One. Bert. I'll tell you something. I have a, I have a hell of a lot bigger goal. And you know what that goal is? I absolutely have to develop a manned space tourism system that's at least a hundred times safer than anything that's ever flown man to space, and probably a lot more. I have to do that. Bert's ambitions are shared by billionaire entrepreneur Sir Richard Branson, and together they have set their sights on helping you reach the stars. Thousands of kilometers away at his private Caribbean island, Necker, Richard puts his mind to taking tourists into space. I'm old enough to have seen the moon landing, and I assumed that I one day would go to the moon. But the decades went by, and government-run space agencies were not that interested in getting you or me into space. So out of frustration, we decided to create a private spaceship company where, where we could get as many people as possible to be able to experience spaceship travel. This is Richard's dream, to use Bert Rutan's spaceship technology to take you on the trip of a lifetime. On board a space plane, you'll jet 60,000 feet up, to then rocket at 5,000 kilometers an hour, up to outer space. Pop your seatbelt, and float in zero gravity. Then, check out the amazing views. You'll coast 104 kilometers above Earth for six whole minutes until it's time to go home. spaceship will glide serenely back to Earth, and um, my guess is that quite a lot of them will be itching to get back up again. Today, rocketing to space isn't for the faint-hearted. Astronauts must train hard to prepare for launch day. They have to be super fit to handle the extreme force of gravity. Three, two, one, zero, booster ignition, and liftoff 
of discovery. But Richard Branson's business banks on just about anyone being able to fly, regardless of age or levels of fitness, something Dave Clark, who must find future passengers, is all too aware of. What if we had the spaceships and we had all these people signed up and then nobody was actually physically able to fly? To find out if the average person could jet into space, the NASTAR Center in Philadelphia has developed a custom flight simulation. We've developed a centrifuge program to replicate as, as almost exactly what's going to happen to your body in your trip into space. GX now, concentrate on your breathing. And finding out how most people would react has never been done before. The data that they have on centrifuge is mostly from the military. These are the most healthy, perfectly proportioned, um, you know, physical specimens of the population. These are top gun pilots. Uh, whereas we have people's kids, people, you know, overweight people, older people. Now talk about your Jeep training profile. 75 space tourists, including Richard, have volunteered to go for a spin. They are about to discover what 5,000 kilometers an hour feels like. You got the training, you got the tools, you know what to do. All right, go. You're at Mach 2, climbing at 80,000 feet. Trainers ratchet up the G's. This is as close as it gets to the real thing. You're feeling the rush in the heart. You're feeling the pressure on your chest. Coming up to Mach 3. The adrenaline is flowing. Here's your chance to catch your breath. Thank you very much. Richard, tell us, what was it like? Uh, it, was, it was wonderful. I mean, it was, um, it's so important to go through that so that when you actually go into space, you can just lie back and enjoy the whole experience and not be worried about, you know, is your body going to cope? Richard sails through the test. But will the oldest volunteer, scientist Professor James Lovelock? He's 91 years old, and he's hoping he too will be able to fly to outer space. Space tourists will feel the power of G-forces, during takeoff and landing, the heart struggles to pump blood to the brain. But with training, it is possible to avoid the dangers. By squeezing your leg muscles, you can improve blood flow, making for safer space flight. Welcome back to Earth, astronaut. You are now our <laughs> most you. senior <laughs> centrifuge rider. You that hold the record. Oh, oh, good. All 75 wannabe space tourists pass with flying colors, proving it is possible to fly into space, whatever your age or condition. Did well. Did well, James. The G-forces are quite brief, and the centrifuge has now shown that really anybody can do this flight. Stephen Hawkins is planning to go into space with us. He'll be able to put up with it. Um, James Lovelock, the environmentalist, he's going to go into space with us. Now, it's just a case of saving up to buy your ticket for $200,000. You know, we've got to try to come up with you know, clever ways of, of getting that price down and down and down. You know, every $10,000 we can get it down opens the, the market up that much more. And I think. 50 years from now, hopefully, literally, hundreds of thousands of people will, will be able to afford to go into space. Richard Branson had the vision to turn space into the ultimate tourist destination. Now, all he needed was a spaceship. Back in Mojave, following his X Prize win, Bert Rutan and his team started engineering his space tourist dream. 
what we're doing is important because it's doing something that's never been done. Bert's prize-winning prototype, Spaceship One, carried just one pilot into space. There's not enough room for space tourists, so Bert scales up his spaceship and creates a version for six passengers. And it's built with the sightseer in mind. Each passenger gets a window seat next to an aisle. It's double the size of its predecessor, so it needs a bigger, twin fuselage mothership. But safety is always a top priority. We can't achieve the level of safety that you do with modern airliners, because they've had seven decades of, of maturity. However, I do feel that uh, to fly the public, this should not be looked at it uh, as a dangerous adventure. But modern airliners don't have to re-enter our planet's atmosphere. Anything speeding towards Earth tends to burn up. Bert's determined to ensure his space plane will be hundreds of times safer than spaceflight today. So, he has developed a revolutionary way for his spaceship to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere slowly. The space plane's wings pivot 65 degrees. Its fuselage flattens into the airstream, creating stable drag, like a shuttlecock. Spaceship Two is so lightweight and the drag so high, it rapidly slows down without heating up. Then, at 70,000 feet above the ground, the wings realign like a glider, and the craft touches smoothly down on the runway. My solution was to find the very safest way to land a manned spaceship. To me, it was the simplest way of doing a difficult job. October 2010. It's taken five years to develop Spaceship Two. Today, she's leaving the hangar for her maiden voyage. At Mojave Spaceport, there is only one question on everyone's lips. Will she fly? Richard and Bert have gambled their reputations and a small fortune on the odds that she will. They are about to find out. Standing next to Bert, uh, watching it get higher and higher and higher. Obviously, Bert was understandably extremely nervous. I was nervous for him and for us. 45,000 feet above their heads, it's the moment of truth. We are armed. Release, release. Clear the plane. Good release. Okay, it's gone. All oh, good, all oh, good. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeehaw! That's great. Beautiful, beautiful flight. She flies perfectly. We got word back that it was flying absolutely beautifully. It was a tremendous moment. You know, we really are close to the dream becoming a reality. Beautiful job, Pete. The final frontier is one step closer. Soon, you could be taking your seat on this spaceship for your unforgettable six minutes in space. But for these stargazers, this is only the beginning. If they have their way, you could travel on their spaceship to an orbiting hotel for the ultimate space vacation. A lot of my life has been about dreams. If you don't dream, you don't make anything. One day, you might see a giant V floating around the Earth. The Wright brothers didn't think there'd be hundreds of people uh, having a meal going to London. I think that in my lifetime, you will see resort hotels in orbit. Staying at a space hotel, you can expect more than five-star luxury. From here, you can gaze on an entire galaxy. 
I think the important thing about being in a space hotel is that you have massive windows and so you can look out at the universe around you and marvel at it. And once you've been there, space travel agents will be booking your trip to the next holiday hotspot. Have you ever gazed up at the moon tracking across the night sky and wondered what it might be like to visit, to fly over its craters or take a walk across the lunar landscape? At 400,000 kilometers from Earth, it would take you days to get here. So once you get here, you're going to want to stay around. In Las Vegas, Robert Bigelow thinks he can offer you the perfect place to stay. His inflatable space station could open as the first moon hotel. What you have is an entire station that's really a potential lunar base. We would use low Earth orbit as, a, as the trial place of assembling these craft. And with a few modifications, we can turn these stations into bases. Once you land here, Hotel Moon will offer the latest in cosmic comfort. This is one resort where they really will have thought of everything, including the breakfast buffet. In the arid desert near Tucson, Arizona, feeding lunar tourists is food for thought. We're going to go to the moon, or we're going to go to Mars, or beyond, and we have to survive. And unless we're going to carry a picnic basket of fresh vegetables and processed foods, which we can't do in the long term, we're going to have to grow our own. If you're going to enjoy fine dining on the moon, you'll need a space food expert like Dr. Jean Giacomelli. He knows how to grow crops that are out of this world. I find this very exciting to be able to use agricultural technologies to grow plants, to feed people like we do on Earth, but to bring that to space. On Earth, our atmosphere filters out dangerous solar radiation that would otherwise wipe out crops, rainforests, and woodlands. But on the moon, there's no protection. For crops to survive, a greenhouse would have to be shielded. Buried underground to protect it from the sun, it could nurture crops with very little help from people. The lunar greenhouse, in many ways, is a robot. It automatically provides its climate so that the plants grow in the way we want them to grow. By the temperature and the light, carbon dioxide, as well as the hydroponic system for nutrients and water. Gene and his team have already built a prototype lunar greenhouse. On the moon, it would assemble itself, pre-packed with seeds ready to germinate. These plants don't even need soil. They can hang inside plastic envelopes, their roots bathed in nutrient-rich water. But there it is. Nice roots, Dr. G. We're growing tomato, sweet potato, strawberry, and lettuce. And this certainly isn't a full diet, but it does offer the crunchiness of a salad, carbohydrate with sugar, and strawberry as a sweet fruit. Lunar crops will generate drinking water and convert carbon dioxide into breathable oxygen, giving you not just a taste of home, but keeping you alive in space wherever you go. The system certainly can be used on Mars and the Moon, but why not beyond? Why, why not in space stations and, and intergalactic traveling spaceships providing food and life support for the space travelers? Getting to Mars on today's rockets depends on planetary alignment.
The flight is only possible every two years, and the trip takes seven months. Once there, you wouldn't be able to set off for home until Earth realigns again, 18 months later. So engineers and scientists have been looking for a much faster way to fly. Houston, Texas. Behind these shops, in a seemingly bland warehouse, a multi-million dollar experiment is underway that could put Mars on your space trip itinerary. The project's mastermind is former NASA astronaut, Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz. Mars offers a, a fascination for humans. The ultimate goal is to actually walk on the planet. Franklin clocked a record-breaking seven trips on the space shuttle. As the wheels touched down on his final NASA mission in 2002, his need for speed grew. He needed a faster set of wings. Right off the bat, we know that we need something entirely different, something that would get us to speeds that are maybe 10 times faster than what we could do today. Scrapping conventional thinking, Franklin throws away the rule book and works out what the problem with speed boils down to. The fundamental issue of rocket propulsion is that you want the exhaust to be very hot, and the hotter the better. So Franklin cooks up a revolutionary new rocket engine. It's powered by one of the hottest things known to man, plasma. And it's about to be fired up inside this vacuum chamber. The rocket is powered by hydrogen gas, which when heated, turns into pure plasma. Powerful magnets push the plasma through the engine to supercharge the spaceship. Plasma is so powerful, you could jet around 4,000 kilometers in a minute and rocket to Mars at 200,000 kilometers an hour, slashing a seven-month flight to just 39 days with two weeks rest and relaxation when you get there. That's a 100-day return trip compared to three years flying today's rocket ships. All my life, I've dreamed about uh, going to Mars and beyond. Space is like a drug, you know, once you get hooked, you don't want to give it up. In Los Angeles, science fiction is becoming science fact. NASA scientist Dr. Kevin Grazier advises Hollywood on science fiction. And he thinks what you see on the big screen could be just around the corner. The days of a few astronauts, cosmonauts, going into space, that's over. In the not too distant future, we're gonna see you, me, regular people going into space. Kevin thinks science will let us boldly take a holiday where no man has done so before. A really far out propulsion system that NASA has actually looked into is antimatter. Buckle up for a journey on board your intergalactic space liner powered by antimatter. A look under the bonnet reveals a magnetic chamber that contains antiparticles. They're fed through magnetic rings to collide with their nemesis, matter. In just a nanosecond, billions of explosions create an enormous surge of energy, 10 million times more powerful than today's rockets, with a top speed of just over a billion kilometers an hour.
distances to the planets are puny compared to the distances to the stars and galaxies beyond. If we're going to go to places further than our solar system, we're going to have to speed things up quite a bit. Enter wormholes. Even flying at light speed to our nearest major galactic neighbor, Andromeda, gives new meaning to long haul. It's a 2.5 million year flight time. So if you're going to cruise beyond the Milky Way, you're going to need a serious shortcut. The name wormhole comes from an apple. Imagine a worm on the surface of the apple who wants to get to the other side. He can do it one of two ways. He can walk all the way around the outside, or he can chew through the middle. The second is a lot shorter, and that's the basic principle of a wormhole. If we could bend space-time, we could create a wormhole, a time-saving tunnel that connects two places trillions of kilometers apart. Wormholes might already exist and could become your intergalactic freeways to mind-boggling vacations. One day, you might board your shuttle for Wormhole Express at LAX or Heathrow, take that shuttle to your Starliner, and zap! Do you fancy a vacation trillions of kilometers from Earth to holiday in a floating city? to soak up a different sun in a distant galaxy. In the future, we may think nothing of traveling throughout the universe. By having fun in space, tourists could create unimaginable new inventions that would reshape our world. Just as the home computer was initially used for simple gaming, it's now the bedrock of our everyday lives. The people that will be flying in commercial space flights are allowed to be creative. There's going to be two or three people that come up with something that's called a breakthrough. And all of a sudden, commercial space travel will look completely justified rather than look at, well, these are just joy rides. Space tourism could take us all to new places and might ultimately ensure our survival. Earth is the cradle of humanity, but one shouldn't remain in the cradle forever. Single planet species don't last. Ask a dinosaur. Pushing out beyond Earth's orbit will truly become a space species. I cannot envision all of humanity remaining on this planet. Humanity's destiny is in space. It's not a matter of if the commercial space industry will take off, but when. It was just over 100 years ago that the Wright brothers flew their first airplane, and now we don't think a thing about jumping in an airplane and flying across the continent or across the largest ocean. Today's commercial space pioneers who are just tickling the edge of low Earth orbit are today's Wright brothers. Space tourism could one day jet millions of us into space. And after the short flight, we may never be the same again. It will open our eyes to see our planet without borders, suspended within an infinite universe. And perhaps one day, Earth will no longer be home. Someday the Earth will be humanity's national park, and it will be a place for all of us to return to see where we all came from. When an oxygen tank exploded on board Apollo 13, the crew was in mortal danger. Next on National Geographic Channel, the astronauts recount their dramatic escape. 